morning, everyone. I know who our dancers in the church are, all right? Uh, hey, if you're a guest this morning, we're super excited that you're here to worship with us. Uh, as a church, it's our vision to connect people to Jesus and love our community. Uh, part of connecting Jesus and loving our community uh, is that faith takes action. It, it takes movement. It's not a standstill thing that we're a part of. Uh, God has called us to move. Uh, but what does that movement look like? Well, what does it look like to be a church on the move? What does it look like to be followers of Jesus that are moving? Now, over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about what it looks like to move in our faith. To not sit still. The church was never designed uh, for us to be a country club of pew sitters. Uh, as Christians, we're called to live on mission. And what living on mission looks like, it means that we are people who live in action. We live in action. We live in movement. Uh, we're not just here as observers. Uh, we're going to look at what those actions look like, what it looks like to move on mission uh, today and for the next several weeks. As we get started, I want to pray, and then we're going to jump right in. God, I'm so thankful for your church. <coughs> God, I'm thankful that we can be here. I'm thankful we can learn and laugh. Uh, God, I'm thankful for you know, the community that you designed where we can be real and we don't have to play pretend. And uh, God, if life's not good right now, we don't have to pretend that it is. And if life is filled with joy right now, God, we can celebrate together. Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, as a church, uh, Father, that you'll help us to focus on you more than anything else. Uh, you'll help us to focus on you. And as we now open your word up today. I pray that it will teach us. I pray that we're moldable. God, I pray that we, um, that your spirit will sink deep into our hearts in ways that maybe we're not expecting. God, that you will confront our life and draw us closer to you. <clears throat> God, we pray that you will, that your spirit will invite us this morning on an adventure of courage and boldness. Jesus, we're thankful that you made that possible through the cross. And as a room full of sinful people, God, we can meet here this morning with the hope of heaven. It's in your name we pray. Amen. It is almost baseball season. Amen? Yeah. Okay. It is almost baseball season. Spring training games started this past week. If you're not a baseball fan, I'm sorry, uh, but I am pumped about baseball. I love baseball. Uh, so spring training games mean that it's almost here. I love going to baseball games. Uh, I enjoy going to the Cardinals games to watch whoever they're playing win. Uh, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. Don't hate me. Okay? But there's an aspect about a baseball game that I enjoy that oftentimes a lot of people miss. Okay? And if, if you're a baseball fan, uh, then you know that when the home team, and for whether you are in the Cardinals camp or the Royals camp, uh, you know that at the home at the home stadium uh, of your team, when the batters walk up to the plate, what happens? There's a walk-up song, okay? They start playing a song of that player's choice. And when that song comes on, all of a sudden the energy that that player uh, hoped would happen all of a sudden begins to take off. And so as they walk up to the plate, you learn, you learn some things about the player. You learn a little bit of their personality, Okay, if they start walking up to the plate and there's a country song that comes on, you learn a little bit about who they are. If they're from another country, sometimes they walk up to the plate and it's a song that most of us don't understand, and you learn a little bit about their background. You learn about who the player is and what they're about by their walk-up song. And what they are hoping is that song comes on, that everything that they have trained for, everything that they got ready for during uh, spring training, the beginning uh, warm-ups, everything on that day, when they walk up to the plate, that, that song is supposed to get them psyched up. It's supposed to get them amped up. And everything that they've learned, they are now bringing into the batter's box, and they are hoping with the energy of the crowd and the energy of the song that they're going to do something great in the batter's box. That they are going to enact all their talent in that moment, and they're going to hit the ball, they're going to hit it well, they're going to hit it over the fence, whatever that looks like. That song, that song, it tells a little bit about who they are, but really what it does is it gets the energy and focus up for that moment where something great hopefully will happen. Maybe you're not a baseball fan, but... Maybe you've been around a locker room, and before the game, there's music playing, and there's this hope that it kind of brings energy to the room. Maybe, maybe not anywhere near a locker room or a baseball field, but maybe you just have that song that when you hear it, you're like, yeah, I'm ready to go, okay? 
There's a lot of times on Sunday mornings that I'll play through what we're going to sing in worship to kind of get me excited about what we're going to talk about and what the day is going to look like. Because those type moments, what we are hoping for is that there will be focus and energy, there will be excitement in what is about to take place. You probably never have, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. Have you ever thought, have you ever thought if your faith had a walk-up song, what, would it, what it would be? Like if every morning you woke up, okay, and you put your earbuds in or, you know, you listen to something, whatever you play music on in your house, hey, you listen to that song every morning when you wake up as a reminder of this is the mission I'm called to. This is the boldness I'm called to. This is the courage that I'm called to. For some of us, for some of us, it might be a song on the radio. For some of us, it might be that faithful, trustworthy hymn that we have sung since we were a kid. For others of us, it might not necessarily be a Christian song. It might remind us of what it is that we're stepping into. And it has high energy and it gets us motivated and reminds us of what it is. If your faith had a walk-up song that you listen to every morning, what would it be? You see, because what that song would do is it would put you in a frame of mind that my faith is not something that I've just learned. It's something that I live out. You see, the gospel... The gospel message of Jesus, the forgiveness of Jesus, the gospel drives action. We, we were saved by action. We weren't saved by understanding, we were saved by action. Which means that faith that we are called to is a faith of action. So what does that action look like? The first action that I can think of is what I just mentioned, it, and it is the action of salvation. The action of being saved. And this, what we need to understand, this is more than just a quick moment. It's more than just this religious moment that maybe makes us feel better or gives us a little bit of hope of heaven. It's more than just this moment. It's a life. It's a life of action. And Jesus clarifies us in this encounter he has in John chapter 3. If you have a Bible and would like to turn there, John chapter 3 will also be on the screen or you can look it up on your phone. Jesus is going to meet this man uh, and they're going to have a conversation. They have a conversation that happens at night and we'll talk about why. But in John chapter 3, Jesus encounters this man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus, he is a teacher of the law. He is well-versed in all of the Old Testament. Uh, he has great knowledge. And he is coming to Jesus. He is coming to Jesus with some questions. As he comes to Jesus, what we need to know is that Jesus has already brought credibility to the table. That what he is is something different. Jesus has already turned water into wine when he's having this conversation. Jesus has already walked into the temple and cleared the temple and flipped tables. And so he has gotten people's attention. Everybody knows that this Jesus guy, he's up to something different. He's bringing something different. And so as one of the teachers of the law, Nicodemus approaches Jesus, and they have this conversation. Beginning in verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, asked Jesus. And you do not understand, <coughs> you do not understand these things. Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. <clears throat> I've spoken to you. I've spoken to you of earthly things that you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of things of heaven? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes 
may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not, whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly, plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So here you have this Jewish teacher uh, who is a part of what's known as the Sanhedrin, which is some of the highest level uh, Jewish authorities, authorities, Jewish teachers uh, of the day, uh, approaching Jesus and recognizing that what Jesus, who Jesus is is different. He calls him rabbi, teacher. And so he elevates his status. One thing that we know about the Sanhedrin is that once you reach the Sanhedrin status, you are old, Okay. You were old, okay? There's, not a, there's no young guys on the Sanhedrin. It didn't work that way. And so this is an older man approaching Jesus who's in his early 30s, most likely like 31, okay? An older man approaching Jesus, which culturally it was not the norm. It was not the norm for a wise, educated man of the Sanhedrin to approach a younger man and begin to ask questions, But yet Nicodemus recognizes there's something about Jesus. There's something different about who he is. And he says, I recognize, I recognize that you are from God because you could not do the things that you're doing if God was not with you. But it says that Nicodemus came at night. Why do you think Nicodemus came at night? Because he was afraid of what people would say. I mean, he is... He is one of the highest ranking Jewish teachers of the day. And for him to be approaching Jesus, the guy that is catching the countryside on fire with all of this different teaching and this different authority for this Jewish man to be approaching Jesus and saying, hey, I mean, it was not socially acceptable. It would not have been acceptable by the Jewish teachers. I mean, nowhere, nowhere would this have been acceptable. It would have been confusing. And so Nicodemus did not want anyone to know what was going on. I wonder, I wonder how many of us approach Jesus the same way. I wonder how many of us approach Jesus in the dark, if you will, afraid of what our coworkers might say, afraid of maybe what friends we've had for a long time would say. Because if they knew that we were If they knew we were coming to church and if they knew that we were desiring to know more about Jesus, I mean, that goes against how we grew up. That goes against what we have always known. That goes against the personality that I live in. I wonder how many of us, even though we we don't want to admit it, I wonder how many of us approach Jesus in a similar way. And Jesus, right out of the gate, All Nicodemus says to Jesus is, I recognize who you are. I recognize that you're from God because what you're doing is different. And then Jesus answers a question. But I don't know about you. I didn't read a question. I didn't read Nicodemus asking him something. Did you? He just says, hey, this is who we recognize that you are. All of a sudden, Jesus says, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Well, thanks, Jesus, but I didn't ask you about that. Here's the thing that he did. He did. For Nicodemus to come up to Jesus with the type of credentials that he has and to approach him the way that he has to recognize the power that Jesus has. What Nicodemus is doing is he is stating an observation. He's maybe asking a question without asking the real question. What Nicodemus is approaching Jesus with is... I recognize you're from God. You're doing things that are changing this countryside. You're doing things that are turning people's lives upside down. Am I really good? Am I really going to experience eternity? Jesus, I recognize there is something different about you. You are teaching about a different kingdom, and I need to know. 
That all of my education and all of my behavior and all of this upholding, all of these religious facts, is it enough? You see, he's asking a question without really asking or without really saying what he means. Reagan, we do this different times. Reagan came downstairs the other day, and she's gotten so used to so many snow days over the past couple months. She came downstairs, and when we told her to go upstairs and get ready for school tomorrow, she went up for a few minutes, she came back downstairs, and she said, Dad, is it going to snow a lot tonight? What Reagan is really asking is, are we going to have a snow day tomorrow, so do I really need to get, set my clothes out and get ready for school tomorrow? But she didn't want to exactly ask that, so she just said, is it going to snow a lot tonight? No, go get ready for school. You know, I mean, there's, there's kind of the question, the observation, but then there's the real question. This is what Nicodemus is doing. As he approaches Jesus, he says, am I really good? Am I really going to experience eternity? And what Jesus comes back with is black and white. He says, you will not experience the kingdom of heaven unless you are born again. And this phrase has been twisted and turned all over our culture. But what Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus as plain as can be is you will not experience salvation. You will not experience heaven unless you make a decision to choose a different life following Jesus. You will not experience heaven unless you make the decision to follow Jesus for eternity. And this is where he begins to communicate salvation. And Nicodemus has a hard time and he's like, wait a minute, I mean, how can you know, born again? I mean, I, I was born once and how does that happen again? And Jesus says, listen, this is bigger. This is bigger than a physical birth. And he recognizes that. He says, flesh gives birth to flesh. He says, listen, that's one thing. But what the Spirit is up to, what God is up to is so much greater. Flesh does its part. Nicodemus, you've, you've, you're educated, you know the law, but there's more to it than that. The Spirit needs to move in your life in such a way that it transforms everything that is happening. You see, as Nicodemus brings this question to Jesus of, am I, am I good? Will I taste eternity? Will I celebrate in heaven? Knowing all the things that he has done that seemingly seem right. I wonder this morning how many of us are asking some of the same thing. Like if we're honest with ourselves, and if we could be honest with one another. There are some of us that we've grown up in church and, you know, we do this singing thing and then we do the giving thing maybe. And then we listen and we go home. And we've grown up maybe going through this routine. But then we think about heaven. And I imagine that there's some of us that deep down inside we ask, am I really good? Like, has it been enough? Am I really going to go? Have I really been forgiven? I think that there's a lot of us that we maybe understand Nicodemus' shoes a little bit more than what we thought we did. Hey, am I really good? Am I really going to get there? And Jesus clarifies and he says, listen, this is not something that you're going to earn. It's not something you're going to learn. It's not something that you're going to behave your way into. It's the spirit acting in our lives. Our salvation is not built on who we are. It's built on who Jesus is. But there is action. There is action to our salvation that is life changing. It's not just a moment changing I mean, at the very elementary level, when we were born onto this earth, that changed us. It changed us from living in the womb to now breathing the air that everyone else was breathing. We now had life that was on this earth, and all of a sudden it changes on the very basic level. It changed from being inside your mom's womb to now outside in life. It was life-altering. And when we make the decision, to accept the gift of salvation that Jesus brings us. It is a life-altering choice. Jesus illustrates it in verse 14. And he teaches in a way, Nicodemus, remember, knowing Old Testament teaching, he uses Moses from the Old Testament. He says, just as Moses lifted up a snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. 
If I were to hold something, now I'm on stage, so it's a little bit different. But if I were to hold something right down here on the ground, there would be a lot of us in the back that you couldn't see what I'm holding, right? You'd have to move your head. I mean, even some of you are looking like I have something right now. I don't. <laughs> but if I had something right down here, there's a lot of you in the back that you can't see that. Okay? But if I stood up and if I held it way up high in the air, all of us are able to see it, right? Everybody in the back, I mean, just my hand, you're able to see my hand raised up. You see, if something is lifted up, if something is elevated, if something, there is a notice of it, you can see it more clearly. This is what Jesus is calling Nicodemus. Nicodemus, listen, if you are going to, if you're going to live in the salvation that is being brought, if you're going to live in the kingdom of Jesus, then Jesus needs to be elevated in your life to where it is seen, not hidden, not closed up, but where it is seen. Our salvation is not something that we hide. The decision to follow Jesus and live in our salvation takes precedence over everything else. This is the Jesus that is called, that we are called to follow. We follow a Jesus of action. And as he brings salvation to our lives, as he brings forgiveness from our guilt, as he brings forgiveness from everything that we have drug around, as he brings forgiveness to a life before him, he calls us to act in a life of following him. You see, Nicodemus is having a hard time grasping this. Why? Because Nicodemus is smart enough to recognize that this will alter every aspect of his life. Nicodemus' career as a Jewish teacher on the Sanhedrin, gone. Nicodemus' social status as a teacher of the law, a member of the Sanhedrin, someone that probably arrogantly upholds all the religious rules, done. Every aspect, his friends, his friendship of people in the Jewish customs, every aspect of Nicodemus' life, if he decides, you know what, I, I understand who Jesus is and I understand the life that he is, the kingdom that he is bringing to this world, for Nicodemus to decide that, it changes every aspect of his life. It is a life-altering choice. Some place... Someplace along the way, I don't know if it has been the drive of consumerism and culture that has drifted its way into the church, but someplace along the way, we have mistaken our mission of movement for a mission of make me feel good. We have mistaken our mission of movement as a church to a mission of make me feel good. That if I decide that I, I'm going to give my life to Jesus, then it will make me feel good. If I decide that I'm going to get baptized and surrender my life, then it will... It'll, it'll make me feel better and I'll, I'll be able to live not with as much guilt. We've mistaken this mission that we have been called to move in for this mission where it just makes us feel good and where we come here so that way we can check it off our list. But friends, our truth for this morning is our salvation is a standing promise with a moving mission. Our salvation is a standing promise with a moving mission. It calls us to life change. It calls us to turn over our lives. And then it calls us to live differently. Now, I, I brought some of my son's Nerf guns. Uh, I love Nerf guns. You know this. My boys love Nerf guns. You know this too. Most of the time, hey, we like Nerf gun fights in our house. Well, all of us except for mom. Uh, we, we like Nerf gun fights in our house. We have fun with them. But most of the time, most of the time, these, along with all of their counterparts, they sit in a tub down in our basement toy room. And when they are sitting in that tub, a lot of evenings, they are accomplishing nothing. They're not taking any ground in our house. They're not winning or waging any wars. They're really losing just sitting there. They're accomplishing nothing. They are not being used as though they were designed to be used. They just sit in the tub, and that's it. They exist. And they might be really good guns, very accurate, precise. But just sitting in the tub, they are accomplishing nothing, right? But then every once in a while, 
Every once in a while, one of our boys will run upstairs, or Reagan will run upstairs holding one of these. And normally, the way that they communicate that they want to have a Nerf gun fight is they come up and they shoot you. They don't ask you. All right? To which, as a kind, forgiving father, I have to repay the bullet. Okay? And so then that normally begins a Nerf fight in our house. Or they come up and they shoot mom, and then that's the end of everything. But, you know, it's whatever. But all of a sudden, when they run upstairs and they have one of these and it's loaded, and all of a sudden they shoot us, now all of a sudden, it, what these were designed for, they are accomplishing something. Now all of a sudden, they are being used for what they were designed. Now all of a sudden, they are being put into action, and they are taking ground in our house. Either they're going to defeat that, or they're not. Now, all of a sudden, what they were designed for is being brought front and center where everybody in our house knows that there is a Nerf war that's going on and there are bullets flying everywhere. Now, what they were designed for is being accomplished. And I'm afraid. I'm afraid that there are too many churches that these guys just sit in the tub. I'm afraid that there are too many churches nowadays where we have been called to live in this holy war. Where we have been called to live on mission, in action. To move in the mission of Jesus that saved us, that calls us to go and save others. But instead, in order to make us feel good, we sit in our tub. And everything that you and I were designed for to step into a broken and hopeless culture, to bring the hope and the grace and the love of Jesus, to bring about purpose in lives that feel like they don't have purpose, instead of going and living on mission, we sit in our tub and we feel good and we sing about heaven and we live with the hope of heaven. But our mission is flatlined and we don't bring anyone with us. Our salvation, the grace that many of us hold on to, it is a salvation. It is a, a, an action that brings action to our lives. It is the action of forgiveness that calls us to live on a mission. Our, our, the freedom that is found in salvation, it is a freedom from sin, not a freedom to sin. It doesn't give us just forgiveness so we can do wrong. It gives us freedom from the moments when we do. It calls us to live different. It calls us to a mission that is moving and is daily taking ground in schools and at workplaces and at ball fields and at clubs and on teams. It is a mission that causes life change, complete life change. Altering. First John chapter 2 reminds us, says, We know that we have come to know if we keep, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. If anyone does not do, you see, our faith is a faith in action. No, we don't earn our salvation by doing lots of good works. No, we don't earn our salvation by being here every week. No, we are granted forgiveness, is saved by the power of Jesus, and called to live on mission in every aspect of our life. Our salvation is a standing promise with a moving mission. Where is it in your life right now that Jesus is calling you to action? Where is it right now that our life, if we're, if we're real honest, if we were to be transparent with one another, our, our mission, it's flatlined. And we're here and we feel good. But we're going to set our actions down as we exit our tub this morning. For some of us, for some of us, the biggest action that Jesus is calling us to is to turn our lives over to him. For some of us, we've never made the choice to turn away from the life completely built on the structure of this world and to step into the forgiveness and the waters of baptism, to die to an old and be raised to new. 
We've never made that choice. We come here, we sing, we even take communion. But we never accepted the grace of Jesus. And maybe this morning, maybe this morning, that's the biggest choice that Jesus wants you to make in order to live on mission for him. There's others of us that we made that choice. We made that choice a long time ago. We decided, you know what? I want to follow Jesus. I want to surrender every bit of the constructs of life that I design, that I enjoy, and I want to live on mission for him. And all of that enthusiasm and all of that hype and all of that energy focused on living on mission it died. It flatlined. Someone disagreed with us and then we were done. It caused us to sacrifice and we were done. It caused us to change relationships and we were done. And maybe this morning, maybe this morning the biggest mission movement that Jesus is calling from your life is to live on his mission. That when we wake up in the morning and we set her feet on the floor, and that we are being called to live in an eternal mission that will not end until we see Jesus again. Our salvation is a standing promise but comes with a moving mission. So when I was in elementary school, I remember I was in fourth grade, and uh, there was a lot of subjects in school that I was not awesome at, but one that I can confidently say that I fully participated, fully engaged, and learned to the best of my ability was gym class. All right? Uh, I know some of you... Some of you, you loved math and you hated gym class. We are polar opposites, okay? Just to let you know. Uh, but I, I loved going to gym class. And once a month, uh, once a month uh, at the school we went to, they did a before school gym class for fourth and fifth grade boys. So when I got to fourth grade, I was, I was pumped. I get to go to gym class early, which was code for get really hot and sweaty and then go to school all day, okay? was what it was. But uh, I remember <coughs> showing up one day. And uh, it, was, it was the before school gym class, and I was, I was excited, and they told us we're playing kickball. And I was like, ah, kickball, okay. Uh, not super jazzed about it, but I was like, hey, we get to do this beforehand. And, you know, so I was good with it. They split us up into teams, <coughs> and I'm playing the outfield. And I'm playing the outfield, and we go back and forth uh, all morning. You know, we kick the ball and run around, everything like that. Uh, our time is just about over. Like, we, we're just about out of time where we have to go change and then uh, go to class for the day. And the team that we were playing, they had uh, a couple runners on first and second. And while they have a couple runners on first and second, we were up by one run. Okay, there was two outs. I mean, the scene is set. And one of, their, one of their better kickers steps up to the plate. And as he steps up to the plate, I was like, this is it. Right here, like, bell's about to ring. This is, this is the kick. And so our gym teacher, he rolls the ball. And as he rolls the ball, this guy, he winds up and he just boots it. And it wasn't a high kick. Our gym wasn't that big. It was one of those, like, just slightly arching, but it was moving quick. And I recognize it's moving to my right. And so I start to move. And right as I move to my right, uh, this fifth grader was Nick. He steps over and he reaches his big old paws up to go catch it. I was like, no, this is mine. This is mine. And so I keep moving. And Nick steps up. And the ball was coming in quick enough that it hits Nick's hands and bounces off. And what seemed like in slow motion, and still to this day, I replay it in my head, what seemed like slow motion, the ball ricochets off Nick's hands and begins to fall. And in a moment, a brief moment of athleticism, emphasis on brief, all right, I run and I dive as a fourth grader as this ball is coming down and I kind of turn and the ball falls into my chest and I catch the ball. And I stand up, I'm like, yeah! And everybody on our team 
Everyone on our team is excited because we just won. And our gym teacher, everyone's like, yeah, good job, Matt, good job, Matt. And then our gym teacher says, you guys are the winning team. Go get changed. And our whole winning team's like, yeah, woo, we're all excited because we just won. In a brief moment of action, I played a part in winning. Am I going into any Hall of Fame? Absolutely not. There's a reason that I remember this distinct moment in fourth grade because they were so infrequent. (laughs) But our team won on that day and I played a part in it. I walked up the stairs into the locker room that day knowing that I played a part in our team winning. The rest of the day when I went to lunch, I knew that I played a part in our team winning. And friends, when the day comes, when Jesus comes back to rescue us or we leave this earth, will we be a part of the winning team knowing that we played a part? Will there be people lined up behind us that say, I'm here because of them, because they lived on mission, because they chose to follow Jesus every day, because they woke up with a walk-up song that energized them to live focused on the cross of Jesus. I'm here now. Are there people right now we go to work with? Are there people in our homes? Are there people that we go to school with that we know they're in desperate need of the hope and the forgiveness of Jesus? And if we chose to live on mission, it very well could be the decision that could lead them to that forgiveness and lead them to that hope. Our salvation is a standing promise. It is a forgiveness of Jesus given to us as a gift, but we are called to live on mission. If the seat under you right now is warm, it's time to get up and move. Our salvation calls us to move. And if we're not moving, then really we're not following Jesus. Because the gospel of Jesus drives towards action. This morning, what action is Jesus calling you to? Us to. So at the end of the day, We're on the winning team, and we played a part. Let's go ahead and stand together. (coughs) When Jesus steps out of heaven and into this life and begins to walk on the dusty roads of Jerusalem, each and every day he woke up recognizing and knowing that I'm one day closer to the action that will save mankind. I'm one day closer to the action on a cross that will bring forgiveness and will reunite me with our people. Will bring forgiveness and life change. And so every day Jesus moved. And he moved in all the different arenas and aspects of life to bring forgiveness to us. This morning as we worship, this morning as we worship, what mission-changing movement do you need to make? Is it a move to follow Jesus, to surrender your life to him? And if that's you this morning, as black and white as Jesus calls it, I want to invite you this morning as we sing, I'm going to be right here by the wall, and I would love to talk with you about what that decision looks like for you and to make it happen. Maybe you did make that decision, maybe years ago, maybe last week, I don't know. But you've not been living on mission. There's no one standing behind you in line. There's no one following you. You're investing in no one to show them who Jesus is. And maybe this morning as we worship, it's, God, I want to live on mission. I want to live in action. I want to live out the salvation that you have given to me. Our salvation is a standing promise with a moving mission. This morning, how does Jesus need us as a church? to move. Let's see.